Yeah, welcome everybody. I'm uh, gonna talk about building yourself an effect system today, live. Um, I'm CTO at Risk 42 for whatever that means with a company of 11 people. So I do a lot more T than C. Um, we started early this year to uh, build a new product as a Greenfield um, project and we built it on top of Zeal. Uh, for reasons I will show on the next slide. Um, and along the way, we've learned a lot of that uh, about that. I also maintain two community um, projects around Zeal. And um, yeah, the other day, or two, two months back or so, I uh, debugged a flaky test, which consistently failed on CI, which was a lot less beefy than my developer machine, but never on my local machine. Um, and the reason was an off by small n back in the, in the zero runtime. So I had to run, uh, to, to read and understand the runtime. And then I thought it's actually quite simple. I mean, it's a lot of code, but it's not that complex. So if you strip away all the um, non-essential features, then it should be quite easy to understand. And that's what we'll try to do today. Um, why zero? Uh, we wanted to start to build a functional application and we started with Cat's Effect, and we had these guys all over the place, um, which are pretty ugly, and basically do exactly the same as that. So we switched pretty early before the first release candidate, I think. So if you've seen the Cat's code below is basically the same. Um, I'll explain what that means. So yeah, why this? talk, the runtime actually is not that bad. It's 1,000 lines of code. It's optimized low-level code, so it's not beautiful, uh, but it's still pr pretty readable, I think. Uh, what we'll do today is yeah, strip away the non-essentials, prefer readabil uh, readability over performance, so we'll do a lot more allocations and partial functions and stuff that is expensive. Um, and on the slides, I've also simplified the types. We're at runtime, all the types are erased. So we have any's all over the place and we need to cast a lot. And I don't do that on the slides. So if something doesn't compile in your head, <laughs> then that's probably because it doesn't compile. Um, if you have questions, we can al always switch to the real code and take a look at that. Okay, so I'm going to give a short introduction to functional effects and the ideas of errors versus defects. Um, then talk about what it means to run an effect because initially it doesn't do anything. Um, we'll use as an example domain the natural numbers in a very low level representation. Um, and then implement operators like ad adding, multiplication, um, and try to execute that. Yeah, and then we'll build a runtime by just building the run loop, <laughs> but not interpreting any of the uh, primitives that Zio gives us. And then we'll build more and more powerful interpreters over time. And in the end, we'll probably end up with something that's about in the same league as uh, Cat's effect, I guess. So without the additional features, but still pretty usable, I think. Um, yeah, so we'll start with a synchronous happy path, basically just build a trampoline. Then we'll add error management, asynchronicity, um, cooperative and fair scheduling, and error recovery in the end. And depending on uh, how, how uh, challenging reading that all that code is to you, we could maybe make a short break here or not. Okay, so functional effects. Who knows what a functional effect is? Who has used one? Like cats or Monix or Zio? Okay, who uses it in production? Oh, not too bad, actually, <laughs> not too bad. Um, so short summary, a functional effect is an immutable value that models side effecting computations. So here we have an effect that 
uh, describes printing to the console, but doesn't actually print to the console. Um, and the return type uh, encapsulates that it, well, it returns unit, it only has a side effect. Um, and the nothing is the error type. This one can't fail, so the error type is nothing. Okay, first thing that's unusual in cats, in, in zero, for example, compared to cats, where you just have throwables and no explicit error type. In contrast, if you, if you take a future, it basically looks the same, but once you execute this, the future is running. And once you execute that, nothing happens. You just have a description of printing to the console. That gives you the ability to use very rich combinators um, on these effects. So um, we could print to the console, what's your name? Then we could read a line from the console. Task is just a type alias for an I.O. where the error type is throwable. So that's what you know from cat's I.O., for example. Um, but when we take a look at the documentation of read line, then we know that it can only ever fail with an I.O. error. So throwable is actually not the correct type here. So we can refine that to an I.O. that can fail only with an I.O. error. And then we yield the name and we have an I.O. Um, of I.O. error or success string. And it still does nothing. And then we can take that and use eventually, which will try read name until it succeeds. So whenever we run into an I.O. error, it will just try to run it again. And then afterwards, the I.O. error is gone. So either we are stuck in an endless loop or uh, afterwards, the error type is nothing. Um, and then we could repeat that until the length of the name we just read is longer than three characters. So now we already have validation and we still haven't done anything. Um, and then we could print line hello name. And we have described the entire program without actually running it. And then you usually say at the end of the world, so whenever you want to answer a request or uh, run a command line program, you actually do something by calling unsafe run, uh, which is implemented by some kind of runtime which then takes your program and interprets it and lazily executes all the actions that you just have modeled, okay? So the output of this could be, what's your name? And then I type foo, and foo is too short. So it asks again, what's your name? My name is foobar, and then it prints hello foobar. But only after running unsafe run. Okay, and then somewhere the effect needs to run and it runs in a fiber. And the fiber basically is like a thread. Um, it executes asynchronously, it can fork more fibers, so we could do stuff like first printing what's your name. Oh, sorry for using different uh, print line, put string line. Um, the idea is the same. Uh, then we could fork a new fiber doing some expensive background work and then continue interacting with the user, reading the name, printing hello name, and then in the end joining um, the other fiber and hopefully by now it's done and uh, we can return the result. Okay, so fiber basically is a lightweight thread implemented inside the library. So like thread, it will run in parallel. You can fork new fibers, you can join or await them, you can interrupt them. But unlike thread on the JVM, there's no mapping to operating system level threads. So this, for example, works on Scala.js, just on a single thread. So um, it's a lot cheaper. You can run tens of thousands of these guys. And you have very fine-grained control 
over the execution of them. I said it runs on Scala.js, so what we do here is concurrency. Um, we we'll probably also do things in parallel on my machine because it has multiple cores, but that's not required for, for running the runtime um, we're gonna build. So we'll compose independent processes, but not necessarily run them in parallel. Okay, um, the error channel. Here we have a read name which returns an IO of a name error or a string. And then we have a seal trait name error and uh, one of the cases is the name is too short. So what we could do is um, we can start from a task. So something that has throwable as the error type refine that to IO error, we have already seen that. Um, then we can handle all the errors. So if we run into an IO error, we just use the empty string as name. Maybe that's useful behavior. Um, so at the end of this, what is the error type? Nothing, nothing. exactly. So all the errors have been handled. Um, the error type is nothing. And then we can create an IO that fails with an error too short when the length of the name is less than three. And what would be a useful success type of that IO? Hmm? Successful type? Yeah, so if, if the name is long enough, what do we return here? Nothing. Three. <laughs> no? What would nothing mean? If we have an effect that returns nothing, then it never returns. Right? If we build an infinite loop, right, we, we, um, we uh, have an effect that flat maps over itself, right? that would run in an infinite loop, that would have a return type of nothing. No, so for, for this it would be unit. So in that case it just succeeds but it doesn't return anything useful. Uh, the useful value is the name we take from up here. And if when we run that, um, so on the, on the last slide, on the previous slide, we had unsafe run, which is just a convenience method that gives you the value on the happy path and throws an exception if something goes wrong. That might be what you want, but might also not be what you want. Um, unsafe run sync is the longer version, which gives you a value of type exit, which models that you could either succeed or fail. And if you fail, there could also be mi multiple reasons why you fail. And we'll come to that on the next slide. So this will actually give us an exit of name error or string, and if we want to access the string, then we'll have to unwrap it. Defects, in contrast, are these nasty errors we didn't anticipate. So that could be everything. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Can we just have one? <laughs> ah. Good timing, Matthias. <laughs> So that could be we run out of memory, we have a stack overflow, um, we have an exception we didn't anticipate and we cannot handle. So these are the things that don't come through the error channel. And another reason for not exiting successfully could be interruption. So we could decide to interrupt a fiber for some reason. A good reason could, for example, be erasing two fibers. And that could be, so, so we have two, two expensive computations we want to run in parallel. And if one of them, suc them succeeds, we take the result and we proceed with that. And we never use the result of the other one. That means we can as well just cancel it because computing the result takes resources and we don't want to spend them. 
right? If you raise two futures, they both, both run to the end. Um, if you raise two fibers, you can interrupt the other one. So you could, for example, create a promise um, and then try to complete it with the first I.O. or the second I.O. in a separate fiber. So we fork two fibers for doing that. And then for both fibers, we await complete completion. And um, when the fiber completes, we interrupt the other one. Okay? And then we just await on the promise. So that would be one application where interruption is, is useful, right? So you only do as much work as necessary. But of course, it introduces another reason why you could not successfully return. So exit actually models all these cases. It's a seal trait that uh, can be a success. And in that case, the error type is nothing because it succeeded. Or it could be a failure. And if it is a failure, then we are giving a cause for the failure. And the cause, again, could be fail. So we have an anticipated error of type E. Could be anything. Doesn't need to be a throwable. Or we could have a defect which is called die, and in that case, we always have a throwable because uh, something unexpected happens, and um, that information cannot pass through the runtime right? because there is no, no channel for passing that kind of information. Or the cause could be interruption. What is important here is that even if something goes really, really, really wrong and somewhere the runtime, or the JVM throws an exception or, or, or something, um, that exception doesn't bubble up. We encapsulate that in the, in the exit value unless it's a fatal thing like out of memory. Okay, what we want to build today is this function here. So underlying, we'll have an unsafe run async, which takes an IO, um, runs it in a fiber, and once that completes, it will call the callback k um, and supply the exit value. And then unsafe run is just convenience around that to make it easier to write tests and demos or execute blocking code. Okay. Questions so far? Then we'll come to the example domain. The example domain we'll use today um, will not be Fibonacci numbers for once. It will be the natural numbers um, built from first principles from the piano axioms. So Piano is the guy who wrote down the axioms about the natural numbers. And the axioms are um, zero is a natural number. If n is a natural number, then the successor of n also is a natural number. And from there, you can build equality, addition, etc. So for example, you can define equality by saying that zero is equal to zero. If you have two natural numbers, then they are equal if they are successors of two numbers that are equal. And if they aren't, then they aren't equal. Okay, so pretty simple definition and the nice thing, it's tail recursive. So it's also efficient for some definition of efficient if you want to encode <laughs> numbers as lists. And in a similar way, you could uh, define addition. So you have two natural numbers, n and m, and you want to add them. And if uh, m is 0, then the result is n. And if m is the successor of some natural number, then the result uh, is computed by adding n and the predecessor, 
and then taking the successor of that. Okay? So n plus m is the same as 1 plus n plus m minus n, uh, minus 1. But we don't have minus. That's why we take the predecessor. Yeah? Can we implement that in an efficient way? I mean, for, does that work for large numbers? We need trampoline here. Yeah, we need trampoline here because um, add is not in tail position. And we could probably rewrite add using some accumulator and make it tail recursive, but this is not. We could also implement multiplication. So we want to add two natural numbers, n and m. And if m is 0, then the result is 0. Okay, anything multiplied with 0 is 0. If m is the successor of some other natural number, then we multiply n by the predecessor, that other number. Yeah. And then we add another n, n, and that's the overall result. Sorry? Add, Instead it, of cons, add n, m, uh, n. In here, here of or? Of n, there, over there. Over there. there. Add of cons of n, m, m. You could do that, yeah. Yeah. So add can be rewritten. Um, this can't be rewritten because we um, oscillate between add and mal. That's why it's there. OK, we can encode that in a stack safe way, assuming we have an effect runtime that is stack safe by um, basically doing the same, uh, but wrapping the return value in an I.O. Um, I didn't introduce UIO yet. So UIO is an I.O. Ah, there it is. A UIO is uh, just a type alias for an IO where the error type is nothing, and it's shorter. So this can't fail. We return a UIO of a natural number. In the, in the, in the zero case, we uh, just return success. And in the cons case, we um, first call add the result will be a UIO of n, and then we map over that because IOs um, are monads and give us flat map, and with that, with success, also map. So we map over it to uh, execute cons. We can do the same for multiplication. Um, the zero case is basically the same. We succeed with zero, and the cons uh, Cons case first does the multiplication and then flat maps over that and does the addition afterwards. And it flat maps because add also returns a UIO. Next, we're going to build subtraction and division. And that's even a bit more tricky because um, it can also fail, right? So uh, we could multiply and um, we could uh, subtract a number from a number that is smaller and then end up with a negative number, but we don't have negative numbers in the natural numbers, right? So that would fail with an egg error uh, and uh, Division could fail with division by zero. And that's actually very easy to uh, notice because if we subtract zero from anything, the result is the other number. If we subtract anything from zero, except for zero, which we have covered in the first case, um, then we end up with a negative number, so that's a failure. 
Um, and otherwise, we just um, uh, recurse, and this is even tail recursive. A division works analogously, but is a bit longer, so we'll skip it for here. Uh, we'll skip it here. So for that, we need to add errors. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Sure. What is an M in this case? I ah. Just can, cannot, uh, is it a multiplication or uh, what, what, how, how you come? Uh, why, why this is ca called an N? Yes. Okay. So the question is why an N <coughs> is called an N. Uh, I just needed a name. So I needed another number. Um, you, you could call it N2 okay. or, or something. Or it's it's the predecessor N. of N. Mm -hmm. uh, underscore N and underscore M. Okay. Yeah, Good. exactly. I think uh, with so the, the code for diff will even contain an N and N because <laughs> <laughs> there's another pattern match. Exactly. So it's an another N derived from an N. The next thing we'll add is uh, parallelism. So far, um, we had a nice trampoline and uh, we have an error channel, but um, we don't do anything concurrently. We'll add that with at all. At all can add up a list of natural numbers, and it does that in a very efficient way. Because um, for an empty list, it's easy. The result is zero. Um, for a list that has exactly one element, it's also easy. We return that number and we're done. And for a list that is longer than one, we split it into two parts. And then we first add up the first part and then we add up the second. And in parallel, we add up the second part and then we add the results together. Okay? How do we do it? Do that, we split the list at length uh, divided by two. And then we fork two new fibers, um, adding up the left and the right part. Then we join the fibers because we need the result of them. And then we add the <coughs> results for the two lists and then we have the overall result. So if we have a list with four natural numbers, how many fibers would we fork? How many fibers, how many fibers would we have if we had a list of four numbers? Two? Three? Two? Three. 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 Four? 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 Who wants more? <laughs> okay, so we'll have the initial one. Um, uh, okay. Right? So one. Then uh, we'll split the list into two and fork two more fibers. And we have two lists of two elements. So we'll split them again and fork two times two fibers. And these lists will have one element each. So from there we can join again. So we'll have, we'll, we'd expect seven fibers. It will be very much faster. It's in a copy of the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. Huh? It returns a copy of half of the yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's not efficient. Well, it's, but it shows you that you can yeah. divide the problem and fork fibers. Yeah. It also, does it also depend on how big the numbers are in the list? Logarithmically. Because oh. you add mm -hmm. and then, I mean, of course, the numbers are very big. And you do your addition, you shove the cons always around. Yeah, sure. So if you have big numbers, it's fine. Sure. I didn't say that this makes sense, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's parallel. <laughs> and to execute it, you need to be able to fork and wait. <laughs> And it's still unfair because, hmm? yeah. okay. Um, and it's still unfair because uh, one fiber could 
join its inputs and then immediately compute the result. But maybe we want to have someone else do some work in between. So what we could do is uh, implement cooperative yielding. So a fiber could say, okay, I will take a break now, someone else take over. Because for example, we are in a single thread environment and some other fiber should also get the opportunity to compute something. Okay, so the next thing we'll build is yielding. So stepping back from the uh, currently running execution and letting some other fiber take over. That's how it's implemented in CATS, if I remember correctly. And then, that doesn't change the code, but in the end we'll do fair scheduling. So if you don't yield by yourself, then at some point um, the runtime will decide that the next uh, fiber should, should uh, run now. Okay, so that's the example we want to be able to run in the end. What we will do is basically take the Zio API, but build our own runtime and fiber. So we'll be able to use all the combinators, well, at least the supported part. Um, we'll also use the same internal representation of effects. Um, that will also give us a few op of the optimizations in Zio. Um, but we'll completely replace the runtime um, and the fiber implementation, uh, purely for educational purposes. So uh, it will probably be much more inefficient. Okay, um, on the slides, we'll work with IOs or UIOs all the time, and we've already seen them. So a UIO is an effect that cannot fail it just have a, uh, ha has a success type of A. An IO could fail with an E or succeed with an A. And in case we switch to um, the real implementation for looking something up, uh, we might see a Zio, R-E-A, and that's basically a reader from R to an effect. So that's the Z rep representation of the Kleisley monster in CATS. All right, so it, it reads something from R and returns you an either in an effect. Okay, if you um, take the time to click through uh, function calls in your IDE, then at the end you will end up at, for example, flat map on IO or Zio. And all that does is just create a new instance of flat map, and that takes two parameters. The IO you called flat map on the left hand side, and the function from the type that, uh, that IO evaluates to, to a new IO. But it's flat map, so it must return another IO. This doesn't do anything. It's just a representation of flat mapping over an IO and doing something with the, re uh, with the result. And similarly, um, for succeed, you just wrap the constant you want to succeed with in a succeed value. And this goes on, right? So for fork, um, you just create a new fork object. And there are some, I don't know how many it are now, about 30 primitives, I think. Um, but we don't need all of them. So today, we'll build the first few 
flat map and succeed will give us a trampoline, fail will give us error, an error channel. Um, fork and effect async will give us asynchronicity. Yield will give us uh, cooperative multitasking and um, in the end we'll do error recovery using fold. We'll not have uninterruptible regions, we'll not have uh, fiber refs, we'll not do any tracing, uh, we'll not switch execution contexts, but that can all be added. Okay. What we're going to build basically is a bit of wrapper code around these lines. We'll build a step function which takes a parameter and a stack. And the stack contains functions from, we are at runtime, all the types are erased, any to IO of any or any. So it takes some value and computes a new IO. Okay, and we can have multiple of these guys on the stack. And then what step will do is take the first function from the stack, pass v to it, that gives us an IO. Then we'll pass that IO to an interpreter, and that interpreter can uh, give us a new parameter value and a new stack, or just succeed with an exit value. And then we run that in a loop until the stack is empty. So if we um, come back to succeed and flat map, here's the definition again, then if we have this very simple program, um, UIO succeed one, flat map X to UIO succeed X plus one. So it basically adds one and two. And we unsafe run that. What's gonna happen is first we'll create that uh, ADT representation. So we'll have a flat map. The parameters are a succeed of one and a function from X to succeed X plus one. And then we'll add a function from any to that flat map to the stack. And the initial parameter will just be unit because we don't have anything in the beginning and the trivial program which doesn't do anything returns unit. And then we start cycling through step. And in the first iteration, we pull the top value from the stack, which is that function we just pushed. And we apply that unit, and that gives us the flat map again. And then we interpret that. And interpreting flat map works by first pushing the right-hand side to the stack, because we can only evaluate that once we know the, um, the return value of the left-hand side. Then we push the left-hand side to the stack and we leave the parameter untouched and then we can do the next iteration. So again, we uh, pop the first element from the stack. In this case, it's any to succeed of one. We apply a unit that gives us succeed one And um, whoop, wrong direction. And this time we leave the stack untouched, but we change the oh, one. Yeah, there we are. But we change the parameter value. Next iteration, we pop x to succeed x plus one. We apply one. This gives us succeed two, 
we again update the parameter value, we leave the stack untouched. And then the stack is empty, and that means that we um, can exit with the current value, and that gives us two. Okay, in code it looks like this. Um, we've already seen stack. We need a type for the interpreter. We want to incrementally build the interpreter, so we define it as a partial function. We don't need to interpret the whole ADT. We can just interpret part of it. Um, the input values are the current I.O., the current input parameter, the current stack, and later for the concurrency primitives, we'll also need a reference to the current fiber. And it returns an interpretation, and an interpretation could be step with a new parameter and a new step, a stack. It could be return with, with an exit value, or it could be suspend. So we don't, um, we don't finish computation, but we also don't step. We'll also need that later for um, asynchronous computations, where we could decide to wait for some input, for example. Okay, the simplest possible interpreter we could build is uh, the one that doesn't do anything and always fails, and that's the one we'll start with. So we'll implement a not implemented interpreter, and that simply returns an exit die of illegal state exception. This does not throw an illegal state exception, right? So even though we haven't implemented anything of the ADT, um, the runtime will not crash. It will just return an, a failure. The smallest useful interpreter is a trampoline using just succeed and flat map. So um, this is in code what we've just seen um, on the slide. If we see a succeed, then um, we use the value wrapped by succeed as the next parameter and we leave the stack untouched. If we see a flat map, then we first push the right-hand side to the stack. K is the right-hand side. Then we push the left-hand side to the stack and we leave the parameter untouched and we return the new stack. And then we still need to drive that interpreter, so we still need to build the run loop. And uh, this is the fiber we'll use for that. A fiber takes two constructor parameters. Um, the first is the interpreter, the interpreter. The second is an execution context, which we won't need for the trampoline, but later. <coughs> has a little bit of state, it could be interrupted. Um, it could have finished computing its result. So we have an option of result here. And it can have a list of listeners, which initially are empty. We can register callbacks on the fiber, which will get executed once the result has been computed and registering a callback just adds it to the, lists, uh, to the list of, uh, oh, the other way around. Um, so the callback is added to the listeners. Oh no, no, correct, sorry. Um, we can interrupt a fiber by just setting the flag to true, and we can schedule execution of the fiber with the execution context. And what that does is um, we schedule a task in the execution context uh, which calls step, and step is the function we've just seen. It's just private so we can ensure it's tail recursive. So obviously this implementation of step doesn't 
immediately give us the exit value. What it will do is eventually write the exit value to result and then notify a listener. If we don't register a listener, then we never see that anything has happened. Okay, then we have step, um, and step wraps, first wraps the interpreter, which is incomplete, it's a partial function, um, and makes sure that we always have some interpretation. Um, if the stack is empty, then the interpretation will be returning uh, successfully with the current parameter. If the stack is not empty, then we'll take the first function from the stack, try to execute it. If that crashes, we die, but not for an exception. And otherwise, we um, apply the interpreter, and if that interpreter is not defined for the current I.O., then we use not implemented as the default. Afterwards, we definitely know what to do. And uh, what we could do is either suspending, we do nothing, um, stepping with the new parameter and the new stack, or returning, or, or if we are to return an exit value, then we uh, first set result to the computed value, and then we notify all the listeners. And now we only need to implement the interpretations, but this basically is the runtime. We need some convenience wrapper uh, around it, so unsafe run async creates a new fiber, registers the supplied callback, and then schedules the fiber with the execution context. And the blocking version of unsafe run, um, well, this is just copied from, from the zero runtime, creates a one shot, which is the blocking equivalent of a promise. So a value that you can complete, but instead of, um, so, so the block, a one shot blocks the calling thread until the value is available. So it creates a one shot. It, um, unsafe runs async and in the call callback sets the value of the one shot and then it blocks the calling thread. So what we now have is the, all the machinery and the run loop and we just can't interpret anything of the ADT except for success and flat map. But we can try to run that. Wrong window. So a short demo showing addition. We use the global execution context. Our interpreter can only interpret succeed and flat map. We create a runtime using that interpreter. And then we unsafe run, adding two and three and then we print the result. And this is what happens. Um, the runtime I use here is the one I showed on the slide, but I added a few print lines to show what it does. So, um, fibers have an ID Starting by zero, it just counts up. And every fiber gets a different color, so we can distinguish them. Uh, the dots are the stack, basically. So the more dots we have, the deeper the stack is. And the first thing is we uh, step, and the input parameter initially is unit. And we interpret flat map. Why do we interpret flat map? Um, because 
in the beginning, um, we have to traverse these two uh, natural numbers. So, so we have to um, unpack these three cons, right? We add the second number to the first one, so um, we first have to step down to zero. So that are the three flat maps we see here. And then we have the first succeed. So we're in the succeed branch of adding because we just add zero. Um, and then in every cycle or in every iteration, we again are in the succeed branch. So uh, we always succeed with uh, longer and longer lists and we work off the stack we have built up. And in the end, uh, the success value is five. Okay, we could try to do the same for diff. And that dies because we didn't implement failure yet. Right, so the, oops, sorry. Um, the return value here is a failure of die of illegal state exception. So we didn't crash in that sense, so we didn't throw an exception but um, we returned that failure. We can fix that by implementing fail and extending our interpreter to also interpret fail. And then Oh, yeah, okay, uh, so, yeah. It still fails, but with a different failure because uh, the example divides by zero. Break or fail? Break? Okay, then, hmm? Yeah, okay, then I would say 10 minutes and afterwards we fail. Okay, so we've had a break, it's time to fail. Um, so surprise, um, fail is modeled as a class fail, which uh, basically offers us a function that we can use to compute a trace. Zero has a nice feature that can give you useful traces of effects, so um, if you have an effect or futures, then usual stack traces on the JVM aren't very useful because half of the stack trace is the execution context. Um, Zio can tell you where the call stack, or can tell you about the call stack in the fiber, so where you come from and also where you go to. Um, that's really, really useful. We won't implement that, but that's what the function does. Um, so what we do when interpreting failure is uh, we use that function to compute the cause of, uh, to, to get a cause of the failure, but uh, we create an empty trace and just um, include the fiber ID because we happen to have that and we skip the rest. But if you want to add tracing, then you need to build an interpreter for the other tracing primitives. Um, which could be done by just creating a stack and pushing um, the current uh, position uh, to the stack and then you need to read it here and fill the stack trace. 
Um, we just take the cause, create an exit, a failing exit from that, and um, then we return and we're done for now. So we cannot handle errors, but we can propagate errors using this interpreter. Okay, and that's what we just saw here. So the result of dividing by zero is a failure with an empty trace um, and the error division by zero. Okay, next at all. As a reminder for at all, we added forking and joining. And I should show what the demo does. Um, so our interpreter now is a bit more powerful. It can do succeed and flat map. It can do fail. Um, and it can do fork and effect async. Effect async is what we need to implement join. Um, and we'll add four numbers, two, three, four, and five. And we expect seven fibers to work on that. And in fact, let's see. So the, the final one is the first one we start. So in the end, we only see the uh, fiber ID zero and it adds up the final two numbers. Hence, we have a very deep stack here. But up here, so A, we can see that things really happen in parallel. Lots of uh, interleaved colored lines. And the largest uh, fiber ID we see is six. So uh, instead, it, indeed, we have forked seven of them. And what do we interpret? We have flat map. We have succeed. No surprise there. It didn't fail, so we don't need failure. Um, and then somewhere in the beginning, we should see forks to start other fibers. And here we see it. And we see a few effect asyncs, which are the joints. So how is that implemented? We have uh, two primitives, fork and async. And fork is pretty uh, simple. We'll start with that. So fork just wraps an I.O. And if we want to interpret fork, then we basically do exactly the same as unsafe run. So we start a new fiber with the same interpreter and execution context as the parent fiber. We schedule it for execution. And then we use that fiber or a handle to that fiber as the next value. Because if we go back a bit, um, somewhere we had an example with forking. Yeah, so we might need that the handle to that fiber later for, for joining it, so we need to use that value. Question? Yeah, I, I get you said we, we run this uh, fiber, but we just create it. Uh, we schedule it for execution. But is it going to yeah. run here or not? It's not going to run here. Um, we schedule it for execution in the execution context. If we go back to, let me switch to the actual implementation because then I can just switch windows, okay? Um, so Fiber has a method, schedule, which schedules a call to step in the execution context. So running, in fact, only means scheduling execution, and then eventually it will run. The runtime does exactly the same. 
unsafe run async, creates a new fiber, registers a callback, and then schedules that for execution. Mm -hmm. uh, thread pool, like for going to thread pool and stuff. And so you try to check how many threads will involve like real threads. No. But I guess that uh, it's indeed a bit boring because I have a four core machine and the default size of the execution context probably would be twice that. So every fiber gets, gets its own thread, I guess but um, I didn't try. But you could restrict it to one or something. Yeah, but so I think it would be interesting to see that it's actually, for example, when fi fibers can be scheduled to the same execution mm -hmm. context, we can see that they actually just uh, schedule to the same thread, they actually execute it on the same thread. Yeah, so... So here we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah, all of them running concurrently. So I probably have a pool size of eight. Um, preview of what we'll do in the end. Um, once we have a fair scheduler, that changes. So this forces uh, fibers to yield to the execution context and then uh, we have a smaller number running in parallel. Because I have a very, I mean, for demonstration purposes, I have a very low threshold for yielding. Okay. Now comes the slightly more complicated part, effect async. Mm. Conceptually, it's super simple, but it contains an optimization which hides that simplicity a bit. The idea with effect async is that uh, an effect async gives us a function which we can use to register a callback to get notified when some value is available. Right, so fiber runs and we want to get notified when it's done. Basically the, the same that run, uh, unsafe run does, unsafe run async. And here's the callback. And now we could be done. Um, to interpret that, we would register a callback and then suspend. Right, so we don't have the value yet, so we cannot run the next step. Right? We have to suspend. And the callback, again, just fibers, uh, fibers our schedule, uh, schedules our fiber for execution um, and pushes the value we just received to the stack. The value is an I.O. Okay, that's the simple version. Now comes the optimization. It might be that we, uh, for example, want to join a fiber which already has computed uh, return value. So in principle, we could just take that and we don't need to go via the execution context and switch threads and do expensive context switches. We could just continue in our tight loop Okay, but that means we have to know whether it's already finished. So instead of just registering a callback, we get an option of I.O. back. And that option is set to a value if that value has already been computed. So it wouldn't block for computing that value, but if it's there, then it will return it right away. And if it hasn't been computed, and then the callback never gets called. And if it hasn't been computed, then we get a none back, and eventually the callback will be executed. That's the optimization. 
And that's why we need to pattern match here. And only if we don't get the I.O. back immediately, we suspend. And if we get a sum back, then we basically do the same as the callback, but immediately. Without a context switch. Okay? We also need to implement fiber await. And we also, that, so in the beginning I showed you that we can register uh, listeners on the fiber. But notification only happens once at the moment where the uh, result has been computed. I can go back to the, or, or switch to that play, that part of the fiber. Here in the interpretation, we only notify the listeners in the very moment we compute the exit value. So if someone registers a listener after that, then it will never get notified. Okay? So in order to implement that correctly, fiber await must, uh, or, yeah, uses effect async as we have just seen, um, and the function registering the callback will um, fold over the result. If we already have a result, um, then we return a, uh, no, if we don't already have a result, then we register a callback and return none. If we already do have a result, then we return it right away. And then we never run into that kind of uh, yeah, deadlock or infinite waiting situation. Okay, we didn't actually implement anything called join here. But uh, the code does join, so let's see what join does. We're now jumping into the Zio library code. So join is a combinator which just calls await and then does some stuff with fiber refs that we don't want to implement. Um, and await is the function on fiber we've just seen, and the code you've just seen is basically just the code from the live runtime, but adapted to use the listeners in our fiber implementation. So that's, that's why it really works with effect async. Okay, so we've already said that so far um, on a more limited thread pool than the one we have here. Um, we maybe after the talk we could just run it on a single threaded execution context. We might want to yield cooperatively, so we could add a yield down here, and then we obviously need to implement that. So interpreting yield would just schedule the fiber for later execution and for now suspend. This is a bug. This should be suspend. Thread or club. There it is. Okay, so what we now see is fiber is executing, executing, executing. At some point, 
decides to yield, then suspends, and this is the outer fiber, and at that point in time, it's the only one, so it immediately continues executing. But if we scroll up a bit, um, yeah. not a nice run. Also not a nice run. Uh, the execution here is such that the fibers immediately resume, so it's a bit boring. Um, okay. It works, so <laughs> <laughs> that's concurrency. You don't, you can't influence the execution order. So what what happens is the fiber suspends, and then if the execution, so if, if the pool is sufficiently small, then the next one takes over, and then when that's gone or yields, then we switch back. With round robin scheduling, we'll definitely see that. Um, that's the last thing we'll add to the scheduling. Um, so what we want to do is we want to force yield after uh, 10 steps, or some configurable number. We'll use 10. And we do that by taking an underlying interpreter um, and wrapping it, and interpreter is uh, just a partial function, so what we do here is implement fu partial function, that's what, why it's not as beautiful as the other interpreters. But um, what we do is we call the underlying interpreter. If it suspends, we also suspend. Um, if it returns with an exit value, we also do that if it wants to step then we check whether we have any steps left by just using a variable counting down to zero. And um, if it is less than one, so it is zero, then we reset it to max and we schedule the fiber for later execution and we suspend. And if it's uh, larger than that, then we just uh, decrease the counter by one and return the step. So whatever we can already interpret before, we can now interpret in a fair fashion. And now we should also be <coughs> able to see that actually happening. Yeah, so here's an example where we can see that. So fiber three is executing. It's uh, force suspended here. So the only thing it can do is interpret that suspend. And then execution switches over to fiber number one until it joins another fiber. I think this probably is 10 iterations. No, it's seven. Um, and then three starts executing again. And we see that pattern consistently, so roughly t ten, um, 10 iterations through the loop unless we need to join some other fiber or we finish earlier. Okay, and the last one that is still missing is recovering from errors. So far, in case we ran into an error, we just uh, failed with that error, but there was no way of recovering from that because we only had implemented flat map, which is on the happy path. 
it would be nice if we could do something like uh, trying to divide something by zero. If that succeeds, uh, map the return value to a string. And if it fails, catch the error and uh, turn it into a success value with some error message, for example. Or translate it into some other kind of error or do something useful here. To do that, we need to implement fold, so a way of uh, flat mapping over the happy path and the error path. And this is fold. Fold basically is the same as flat map. So it has a left-hand side, which is called value here. And it has success, which is the same as the right-hand side of flat map. But it also has failure, which is the right-hand side in case we run into an error. So failure uh, takes a cause and returns an effect. And then there's a nice trick because uh, fold implements function one from A to IO. And that means we can directly push it to the stack. And that's what we do. So the interpreter for this, uh, the interpreter for fold looks exactly like the one for flat map, except that, so we first push the right, um, there, no, it's correct. Yeah, we first push the right hand side, and that works because apply is an alias for success, which is the right hand side. So we push the fold to the stack directly, then we push the left hand side, the code looks exactly like the one for flat map. And then we continue with that. And we have the same uh, not applied refactoring here. So this should be snap. Now, when we see fail, then we need to change our behavior. Again, we compute the cause. But then we search the stack for mm. some fold, because that's the only way we can recover from the um, from the error uh, case to the success case. Okay? So we drop everything from the stack uh, until we find a fold, and that works because fold can directly be pushed to the stack. So that's the trick we've seen. Okay, and in that remainder of the stack, uh, if we have found a fold, then we take that fold, we push the error, um, the error handler in that fold to the stack, and we use the cause as the parameter, and then we continue stepping. And if we don't find a fold, then we fail. Okay, so we throw away everything until the error handler, and then we continue with the error handler. So this is the code we've just seen on the slide. It's expected to fail uh, with a division by zero, and then to recover that to this error message. Oh no, division by zero. And that's what it does. So it pushes full to the stack. Um, then it tries to divide by zero, runs into a fail, interprets that by pushing um, fail division by zero, uh, by, by using fail division by zero as parameter and um, pushing the uh, the error handler, and then it runs the error handler, and the result is a success with message, oh no, division by zero. 
And that means we can run all the example code and we are basically done. What we have not implemented are fiber traces, fiber locals, that's basically thread locals on steroids um, with nice properties. So when you fork a new fiber, it inherits the uh, fiber locals from the parent, but then you can overwrite them just for the child, stuff like that, really useful. Um, we didn't do anything with the environment. So the reader uh, part of Zeo. Uh, Zeo can mark regions as interruptible or uninterruptible. That means you can do safe initialization or sa safe acquisition and release of resources um, because you cannot interrupt releasing. That works analogously to uh, fold. So you, you skip only over interruptible regions and you make sure that you run the uninterruptibles. Uh, we didn't do execution context pinning, so you can switch between execution contexts and that really works until you uh, exit that region of the code. So it's not like in cats where someone else in the library can decide to switch out of that execution context again. Um, you can dump fibers. Yeah, I also already talked about managed resources. So there's a lot more, but basically what you would do is build more powerful interpreters. And then you'd probably need one or two small changes to the runtime, but basically the runtime will, or, or the, the, the run loop in the fiber will basically stay what we've, uh, what we've seen. Okay, thank you. The code and the slides for this talk are on GitHub under this URL, including all the examples. Um, and just in case, we are hiring. <laughs> Thanks. Are there questions? No questions. So, <laughs> that would be good. Yes. How far did you use these kind of idea for your uh, startup? Uh, which idea? The runtime? Yeah, like applying this pattern to your whatever your worry that I'm on. Your ah, your okay. So, risk assessment, if I, if I mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so far we've used an off-the-shelf rule engine and we're building a new one which uses a very similar pattern. So it basically builds, um, so y your rules are interpreted in a very similar manner and that means that you can a, have a very um, powerful API to it that makes sure that everything is type safe and you cannot like, um, write a rule that matches on a type that another rule doesn't. So, so, so one rule infers a fact and the other one wants to use it and the types don't match. That is, for example, easily doable in rules and it's not possible in that uh, language and then you can just take two sets of rules and throw them together and interpret that as one. So I, I guess that's a similar pattern. Um, the idea for this talk uh, came up because I fixed the bug in the runtime. Uh, we had a test that would get stuck on CI and always work locally. Um, the CI system was a lot less beefy and the bug was that in the run loop. So if you force yield, it, or a force yielding was not implemented like here by immediately scheduling the fiber for a later execution, but by pushing another yield to the stack, which you can do, I mean, semantically it's correct, but the problem is that you might not have enough cycles left to interpret that yield. So 
it would do would be immediately yield again because you don't have any cycles left and then you just build an infinite stack of yields. Um, that's how the idea for the talk came up because for that you have to understand how the run loop works and then you can ignore 90% of it. Yes? Now that you have built your effect one time on your own, would you say Scala is a good language to do that? Because compiler can't check if you are using it correctly and uh, JVM doesn't support the concept of spider traces. It's always something you see when new pops up with a thousand stack trace uh, exceptions and you have to look for the real Is that a question or an opinion? <laughs> um, no, why? Um, <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, if you, so, so the difference is you have that in the um, in the standard library, but it would do exactly what we've seen here. S so you you can have different libraries implementing it differently that can be good or bad depending on what you prefer. But I mean, you're not stuck to one implementation. Um, for some features like proper traces, also for fiber locals, you have to extend the runtime a bit. So if the runtime was in the standard library, it wouldn't be possible to add such features. So I think it's good if you can do that uh, in a library. Of course, it would be nice to have better support in Java, but I think this works perfectly well. The other half of the question was um, that the JVM cannot ensure any type safety, if I understood that correctly. For example, Scala YouTube Random mm -hmm. doesn't have an I.O. interface. System current time release doesn't have an I.O. Mm -hmm. interface. You usually work with people that are not as smart as you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think so. And they make mistakes while you're on vacation. So <laughs> <laughs> they just don't use the effects because they don't come up with the idea that they are using them in fact. And the compiler can't make sure that in the beginning Scala's um, turning point was we checked most of the stuff so you don't make mistakes. And now we can do mistakes all the time. Again. Um, okay, so if you really want to do that, then it will let you, yes. So I think you need to get used to the fact that you are using effects. And you need to learn to spot when you use effects because that's not so easy. That's part of the learning curve. Once you get used to that, you would uh, then not use uh, random or system current time millis, but the clock from, from your zero environment, which would give you a lot of nice uh, properties, such as uh, you can just fast forward your test clock, for example. Um, but yeah, you could do that. On the other hand, if you really want to, you could probably read the current time from a file or you could, I mean, there usually are lots of ways of doing things and some are better and worse. So I don't think that's a fundamental limitation. I think for writing such an interpreter, Scala is a very nice language. I mean, what we just built here is pretty nice, modular, uh, extensible. I enjoyed writing it, so I think it's a good language for that. Yes. 
Yes. So how does this affect the third choice possibility? Is is this somehow optimized in, in zero runtime? Um, yes. The the zero runtime is a lot more optimized than what we did here. So here we did a lot of allocations. I think the runtime does none or close, very close to none. I mean, pushing to the stack is an allocation. I'm not even sure whether it's a list or an array. Maybe it's not even an allocation. Um, especially for flat map, there are optimizations that um, don't even go through step, but if if you can interpret the next primitive uh, without uh, using the stack, then it's in mind. It, I mean, that's part why of, of why it's not that readable. Um, let me see. So evaluate now is the run loop of um, of the zero version. And as you can see, no partial functions, 400 lines of uh, code. And let me see, where is flat map? Um, so as you can see, flat map even tries to directly interpret the nested IOs. So it's a lot more optimized than what we just built. I mean, we, we also created a try for each uh, iteration and we create an interpretation in each step and uh, all of that doesn't happen. I think you could do that. And I know mm -hmm. that in the next versions of Java, somewhere the spiders are coming mm -hmm. that made with Java. Yeah. So those could be also. Was it Ruby? Yeah. 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 I guess you could build on top of that and then just add the features that are missing in that implementation. Um, you could, I mean, what's very different in the interpretation I did to the one in Zio is that the one in Zio is very optimized, but not modular at all. Um, but if you find an approach that is somewhere in between, then I guess you could build on a lower level uh, fiber implementation and then just add a few more features. I mean, in my if you could just add an interpreter and then have a more powerful uh, runtime at a heavy cost, right? I mean, lots of allocations, but if you can find some other encoding for that, then I think you could build on Project Loom, for example. More questions? And thanks again. So, yeah, if there are no more questions right now, thanks a lot, and I think you are probably here for one or two and other I'll be here. questions. Yes. So, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.